Welcome back, everyone. Next, we are going to go over some basics of extraction with Dave LaRussa, Director of Sales at Apex Supercritical, a leading CO2 extraction system manufacturer located in the United States. Dave has 20 years of sales experience and helps streamline and implement processes that help improve the customer experience. I am happy to present Dave LaRussa, who will share with us his vast experience and knowledge. Hello, I'm Dave LaRussa with Apex Supercritical, and today we're going to talk about Cannabis Extraction 101. Apex Supercritical started uh, producing extraction equipment back in 2001, and we actually started uh, producing this equipment to extract other uh, products such as flavorings and oils from other plants. It wasn't until 2009 where we say cannabis found Apex. Because of the boom out west in California, Colorado, and Washington, there was a demand for other extraction methods, and CO2 was that method. And because of that, in 2012, 99% of our customers actually were in the cannabis industry. With this boom, uh, it caused us to have to expand, and in 2015, we actually moved into a new facility in Johnstown, Ohio. And in 2017, we actually shipped our 500 system into the cannabis market. Fast forward to 2019, with this incredible growth, we've actually had to move into a new facility to accommodate the fast, rapid production of uh, extraction. And this year, we actually shipped our 600 system into the cannabis industry. So when we look at the numbers within the cannabis industry, you can see there's a 26% growth rate. You know, looking at where we were in 2014 and, you know, through to the years, it just considerably, con considered to just con continue to grow, um, you know, as we are in 2019. And then the expected growth um, through the next couple of years is, is still quite staggering. So when we talk about extraction, what's the whole idea of extraction? Um, the idea of extraction is to get oils to um, have other means and methods of using cannabis. And where we see the, the growth, it's infused products, edibles, things like that. So here's an article uh, highlighted in MJ Biz back in 2017 where you know the demand for edibles and the need for it well in order to get to those different products you need to complete extractions here's a chart that kind of shows the trend and how the the trend is up with the concentrates and edibles and you can see that roughly 40 percent of the revenues are from the concentrates edibles and the topicals versus the uh, uh, typical method or the uh, traditional method of smoking. And then recreational is is on the climb as well. Um, the recreational industry, especially uh, in the markets for edibles and concentrates, continue to grow. Both categories are large enough to sustain multiple players and operate solely in this segment of the market. So you can see the growth in the, the market through edibles and concentrates. Well, the question is, how do you get to the concentrate? What are the products that you get from actually completing extraction? One of those products are the vape pens. I mean, there's different methods of vape pens, but very common, very popular. Um, you have the vape pen cartridges, you have a full spectrum extract, and then your disposables. So commonly used solvents to complete the extraction for the vape pens is CO2 and butane. Another product is distillate. Distillate is a higher concentrated product. Um, you require additional post-processing to get to that, but what this this is is actually gives you a higher concentrated THC or CBD levels within the product. Another product is the terpenes. And terpenes is the uh, actual flavors and aromas that you get from the from the plant. Uh, there are many different artificial terpenes out there, such as flavorings, 
but by using the natural terpenes, they actually interact with the plant material um, much better than the, the artificial ones. So when you use the products from the same plant, they respond better to each other. So when you look at extracting terpenes, uh, they're very, vi very violatable. So using CO2 and steam distillation is the primary method uh, to actually capture those terpenes. Another common product are the tinctures. These are the drops where people will either just take them orally or actually uh, use them to introduce them to either a beverage or an edible of, of some sort. The common solution to or solvent to extract uh, these drops are CO2 and ethanol. Another product that you get from the extraction are the topicals. That's the bombs, lotions, rubs, and salves. Uh, you can use this either by uh, introducing the oil or taking the waxes and lipids from the, uh, the extraction process and, and using it. And you get the waxes and lipids um, for these products from all the methods, all the extraction methods. We talked about how edibles uh, are very common. Uh, you see them in brownies, drinks, um, gummies, candies, different things. So very popular. Uh, also, um, you can use any method to uh, extract the oil or the uh, compounds you need for, for the edibles. When you look at the pills and capsules, uh, primarily used for the medical and the pharmaceutical side of the business, uh, you do see them in the recreational side, um, but primarily in the in the pharmaceutical. And you can use any method to extract this. This is really taking the oils um, from the plant. You know, when you look at the the tinctures, um, the tincture may maybe a lower concentrate where with the pills and the capsules you end up with a higher concentrated product. Hash oil is another product you get from extraction. Uh, other names would be food grade, honey oil, or goo. And you can see that you can get hash oil from any of the methods, any of the solvent methods of extraction. We talked about getting the wax um, from the product, and that's other names are known as uh, butter, crumble, or honeycomb. And then there's also shatter. That's actually getting the extract to a hard form uh, after the extraction where you can pull and snap it. Um, this way you can control the quantities you want to, to use. You have your live resin, which commonly solvent is butane and propane. And then last but not least, the suppositories can also be used uh, or introduced. So when you look at those methods um, of those different products, or I should say when you look at those products, there's different methods to achieve those. So when you uh, decide on what type of method you want to use, you have to actually ask yourself, you know, what is the final product that I want to, to achieve? You know, am I looking to get to just a crude, or am I looking to get to um, an oil for tinctures, or I want to use uh, vape pens. Um, so when you look at these methods, each method or each product requires a different method. Some methods are better than others for the particular products, but regardless when you complete the extraction, if you want to go beyond crude, additional processing is required. And we'll get into the different extraction methods and the fundamentals of extraction um, through the presentation, and you'll see how some methods uh, work better for certain products and some work better for other products.
So when we talk about the fundamentals, the fundamentals are separating oils, waxes from botanical plants, uh, sometimes referred to as concentrates. So there are two basic methods. There's a mechanical method and a solvent method. The mechanical method using a dry sleeve, ice water hash, or bubble bags to get to the concentrate is one way. And then when you look at the more commonly used, which are the solvents, that would be CO2, butane, propane, ethanol, hexane, uh, refrigerate, refrigerant gas, and nepathyl. When you talk about these fundamentals, all methods are capable of performing the different extractions. None are better than the rest. You really just have pros and cons depending on the product that it is that you want to get to. So talking about the mechanical, the pros and cons for that. Relatively low, low tech, cheap, low tech, low yields, but labor intensive. With the solvent, it's simpler to use. You can use like a standard kitchenware. Uh, the cons are it's difficult to scale, and you can't separate extract from the actual solvent. So when we talk about the prones for CO2, um, CO2, it's high selectivity. You can separate the weights, not necessarily the cannabinoids, but the weight of the product. There's no residual solvent left in the bulk extract. So when it gets to post-processing, it takes less time to post-process. It's easily automated, and there's a good perception that it's a clean solvent. And you can see at the bottom of the slide the different uh, types of fractions. You have the terpenes, and then you have a subcritical, and then a supercritical uh, fraction. The general cons of CO2, you have higher equipment costs due to the high operating pressures, slower extraction times, especially in subcritical, and then scaling can be difficult to do batch operations. There's three different types of equipment out there when it comes to CO2. You either have a manual, where you have to do a lot of adjusting. You have a semi-automatic system where you do um, partial adjustments, or you look at the fully automated systems where you basically will load the system, start your system with your parameters, and then come back when the extraction is complete. The basics of CO2 extraction is actually taking CO2 gas uh, introducing high pressures and higher temperatures, which thus converts it to a liquid. And it's actually that liquid that will complete the extraction. And you can complete the extraction either in subcritical or supercritical condition. The difference between subcritical and supercritical is the amount of pressure, temperature, and time you complete the extraction. When we talk about subcritical, it's actually lower pressures, lower temperature, but it takes longer to complete an extraction. Where with supercritical, it's higher pressure, higher temperature, but it's faster. Whether you're doing a supercritical or subcritical extraction, the, the process is the same. It's a four-step process. It's actually filling the extraction, extraction system with CO2, converting it to um, or introducing pressure, which thus converts it from a gas to a liquid. And it's that liquid that it actually uh, runs through the, the material, the, the biomass, to extract the oil from it. As it moves through the system, uh, the temperatures are lowered. And then as it converts back from a liquid to a gas, then the oil is collected in the separator vessels. And then the CO2 is recovered back into the CO2 cylinder, where then you can reuse it on your next extraction. So we talked about subcritical CO2, lower temperature, lower pressure, slower extraction times. This is where you can actually preserve your terpenes though. This is where you'll complete a terpene run where you'll capture your flavors and aromas. Uh, because you're, low, you're operating at a lower temperature and a lower pressure, there's less plant degradation, thus preserving those uh, terpenes. When you look at the supercritical, which is higher temperature, higher pressure, it's a faster extraction, but you have more waxes and waxes and fats in the product. So it's pulling more, um, more, more product or more uh, things out of the plant.
When we talk about the general pros and cons of butane and propane, the pros are that they're lower equipment costs due to low operating costs, or I'm sorry, uh, low operating pressures, uh, the flexibility of using butane and propane in a, in a mixture, you get higher yields, uh, medium extraction times. This is great for dabbing type products with your shatter and your live resin. The cons to butane and propane though are they're very expensive to automate due to the explosivity. There's high facility costs due to the explosivity and then the residu re residual solvent limits. You'll actually need coal to avoid any of the waxes and the chlorophyll from being extracted and there's a bad perception in the in the market due to regulatory groups. Scaling can be very difficult due to the batch operations and the limitations on the solvent quantity. You can see two examples of uh, butane protein, propane systems. Um, there's a self-contained C1, D1 room um, and then you also have your hydrocarbon system. Just a general overview of how propane and butane work. So you can see in step one, you're actually taking the propane or butane and then you're actually um, moving it into the extraction column. This is where, as you introduce the butane and propane to the plant material, that solvent actually starts removing the oils from the dry biomass. And as it moves through the process, similar to CO2, it will collect in a collection vessel and that's where your oil will, will be, but then you'll have the butane and propane will continue through the process where it'll then go through the expansion filter and then through a recovery pump and then you'll actually bring it back through through and you recover the, the propane and butane. The thing with pro, pro, excuse me, propane and butane is you have to understand your local requirements. Because it is very explosive, you have to make sure that you have the appropriate safety things in place, such as a sealed room, fire suppression, gas detectors, and exhaust system. You know, seeking out your local municipal municipality to find out what those regulations that uh, you need to abide by, um, those can be very expensive as well. You know, it's usually approved by either a engineer peer review, um, or a precise instruction manual, electrical requirements that has to be listed, things of that nature. As we move to the pros of ethanol, uh, the pros of ethanol, I mean low equipment cost due to the uh, General pros of ethanol, pros, uh, low equipment costs due to the, uh, the pressures that you use, there's higher yields, there's faster extraction times, well accepted, commonly used in other industries, relatively easy to scale. There are two ethanol extractions, there's either a warm ethanol extraction or a cold ethanol extraction. The general cons of ethanol, there's moderate facility cost due to the flammability. It's not explosive, but it is flammable. And then you have chlorophyll that drives cold processing and post filtering. The residual solvent limits, and then ethanol is taxed and the losses can be high due to absorption in the plant material. There's significant post processing energy to recover the ethanol. So you'll actually have to make sure you remove all the ethanol from the material uh, before you put it into your final product. Here's a couple examples of the ethanol extraction equipment that you may use. This is a metal type reactor versus the gla glass reactor. So when you complete an extraction, you have to ask yourself, what is the final product that I want? You know, are you looking for a vape pen? Are you looking for um, tinctures or edibles? Um, unless you want to just take your product too crude, there will be secondary processing required. 
you know, the secondary processing will give you the desired result. And each product requires a, a different or additional steps, you know, whether it's filtration, decarboxylation, winterization, the recovery of the ethanol from the winterization process, or using a vacuum oven to get to shatter or crumble, or if you're looking to get it to a distillate using distillation, which is the process of getting a higher concentrated product. So your post-processing equipment can consist of vacuum ovens and pumps. And these are the ovens that will either decarboxylate uh, or will remove additional moistures or ethanol from the product through your either extraction process or through your winterization process. Other ways of removing the ethanol from the winterization process is rotor evaporators. Obviously you can see there's different capacity, there's different quality. Uh, depending on the size of operation you're, uh, you're running will determine the size of equipment you'll need. And then we talk about shore path. You know, to get to a distillate, to get to a higher concentrator product, if you're looking for the higher THC levels or the higher CBD levels, um, running it through either a short path distillation is one method or running it through a thin film spinning band distillation. Now one item that I did not cover on here is if you're looking to isolate CBDs from THCs. Um, that would require uh, a product called chromatog or a process called chromatography. Um, that's getting further downstream when you're trying to isolate those different cannabinoids within the within the product. So as you can see, regardless the method that you complete your extraction, there's additional processing that will need to take pace, place or further refining. Um, and depending on what that product is you want will determine what that post-processing step is. So when we talk about comparison, um, so when, let's look at costs. So throughout the presentation, we talked about the equipment costs, facility, maintenance, etc. So this is a chart that just kind of gives you a highlight of the comparison, whether it's CO2, butane, or ethanol. Um, you can look at the equipment costs. You know, we talked about CO2 is higher equipment costs than the other two methods, but then it's offset with the lower facility costs. So you really have to gauge, you know, what it is you want to complete, you know, how much money do you want to invest into your facility? And then also when you look at your maintenance, you know, what is it going to take to keep my system maintained? And then also operating. And then looking at that operating cost over time, what will, will that outweigh the higher cost of the equipment or lower cost of the equipment? And then you also have to consider your solvents. You know, when you look at CO2, you get to recover that solvent and reuse the, the CO2. Butane and propane, you still can recover, uh, but you don't recover as much. And then ethanol, the solvent costs are quite high. Um, and then also keeping in consideration is when you expend your ethanol, that you have to dispose of that properly. And then the comparison of the different types. You know, we talked about the presentation how no method is better than the next, um, just pros and cons. Here's a chart that talks about the, um, I'll say the pros and cons of the method to get to the desired product. Desired product. As we look at the vape pens, you know, we, we talked about any method uh, is, is adequate for, for the vape pens. You know, when you start looking at dry, uh, the live resins, you know, if that's a product you want to, to, to sell, you know, matching up the appropriate method um, and then uh, matching up the cost, you know, to, to that product. You know, as you go through this process and identify these different things, if you're going to offer uh, a variation of products, you know, looking at maybe a possible um, combination of the, the different methods, maybe a smaller CO2 system and an offset with ethanol. Or, uh, or butane. Um, looking at the, the dabbing products, you know, if that's one of the items you're looking to do, obviously there's the, the different uh, good, bad, or okay methods. Dislets, 
and then the terpenes. So when we look at the terpenes and the edibles, you know, using CO2 to get to those natural flavors and aromas, um, you know, you can't capture that with the other methods because they're actually introducing heat, and heat actually degrades the the plant material, uh, thus um, destroying the the terpenes, which are those aromas and flavors. And then also the infused products. You know, looking at CO2, it's okay. Uh, it's not so great for butane, uh, but it is good with, with ethanol. So this just gives you a snapshot to help you with your decision, your decision making process or your planning process and things to consider as you go through the process of what products do I want to offer, what is the appropriate extraction method for me, and you know, how do I further refine my product um, based on, on the needs of the market. So that concludes my presentation. If anybody has any questions. That was a great presentation given by Dave. Great knowledge to have for a beginner. Um, so today Dave is unable to attend the question and answer session. So we will be joined by Nick Prystash, who is a sales executive at Apex Supercritical, and he is going to answer the questions today. Um, so welcome, Nick. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Great. So we have about six questions for you today. Um, so I think we'll start with a general kind of a general question, which is how do I choose which extraction method is right for me? That is a, a really good question. Uh, I, I actually have to field this one quite a bit when I talk to people and, and we're trying to discover what their needs are. Um, you know, as Dave said in the presentation, there are pros and cons to each extraction method. And I regularly tell people that you know your your means of extraction should probably be your thirtieth decision. Um, after you figure out where you're going to fall in the market, what kind of products you want to offer, do you have your own retail brand? You know all these factors play into what's going to be the best extraction method for you, or if there's more than one. Um, you know there's there's quite a long discovery phase and, and conversations that have to be had between me and a potential customer or the potential customers and and their their business team to decide what's going to be that what's going to be that best method. Um, but across the board, I can say that CO2 gives the most versatility. Uh, ethanol would give you the highest throughput. And hydrocarbons, uh, the butane and the propane, are probably going to give you more of those craft products, the dabs and shatters and crumbles and things that are people are looking for in the more of the recreational market. Great. Thank you very much. That was a great response. Um, OK, so the next question uh, that we have today is, what would be your opinion on the best extraction method with solvents for a cannabis oil company with low budget in terms of efficiency, budget, absence of solvents in the final product, quality, et cetera. And also everything is being translated today. So just to remember to speak um, slowly so that we can get a good translation. Absolutely. Uh, for a, a cost prohibitive startup, I would say that you should probably look for some used equipment. Um, you can find a lot of good ethanol equipment or CO2 equipment out there on the secondary market that you can pick up for a, a, a fraction of the cost that can get you operational. Uh, things to consider, though, with ethanol extractions is that while your equipment costs are low, uh, your facility costs are going to be high. When you look at a C1D1 or a Class 1 Division 1 or a Class 1 Division 2 rated facility, those facility costs can outweigh the cost of your equipment expenses by four or five times uh, the, the cost. Uh, that said, CO2 has very low facility costs, but a higher equipment cost. Uh, so you kind of have a trade-off there on, on one way or another. You really just have to try and figure out, again, what products you're looking to make, and then you can kind of decide from there if you want to look into the ethanol side or the CO2 side. Perfect. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, okay, and going going along a similar kind of question, for the pharmaceutical uses of cannabis, which is the best method to use and obtain better quality of compounds? That, that again, depends on the, the compounds you're looking to recover. Uh, you know, there's no simple answer for anything in this industry. If you're looking for an individual compound, you want to have just a CBD or just a CBG isolate, uh, I think that ethanol is going to be a, a better return on investment for you. you know, at the end of the day, an individual compound becomes a commodity. You know, so how fast and how efficiently can I produce that compound and get it back out the door? And the buyer on the other side says, how, how much can I buy and, and how little am I paying to get it? Ethanol is going to be your fastest ROI for that. Um, if you're looking for the full spectrum or more of a bodied uh, pharmaceutical grade, 
pharmaceutical grade product, uh, CO2 gives you that flexibility and that selectivity. You know, again, going back to uh, comparing the two solvents, comparing the affinity for that solvent with the cannabinoids you're looking to recover and uh, the selectivity within that affinity range. CO2 gives that versatility to try and isolate certain weights of oils based on your pressure and temperature, which can help you in the, in the post-processing refinement uh, while still trying to retain a full body of, of, or a full spectrum of your cannabinoids uh, without as many of the heavier weight waxes and lipids. CO2 gives that flexibility. Uh, and then on, on top of that, it gives you flexibility to adapt with the market. So while you can produce a, a CBD isolate or a THC isolate via CO2, it's going to be a, a slower process to get it done. But if the market changes back towards a full spectrum, now you have the same equipment, you're just processing at different parameters to try and get different compounds back out of your, out of your feedstock. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we actually have uh, six more questions now because we got a couple when you were speaking. Um, so my next question is, which extraction method would be the best to get a CBD essential oil or like 99.6% CBD? For a 99.6% a pure CBD, again, you're going back to an isolate. Uh, I would revert back towards a, an ethanol extraction if that is your only goal for your business model. Uh, if you're looking to have more rounded products and more of a retail brand, then again, you want to look for something maybe in the hydrocarbon side for the craft products or maybe in the CO2 side for some of the full spectrum extracts. Okay. Um, thank you very much. The next question is, can you use the oils extracted using CO2 with chromatography columns? You can. Uh, it, it, the thing to consider here, though, is your consumables with that chromatography equipment. Uh, it, once you have a, a, a chromatography provider, so the equipment that you choose, you're kind of at the will of that, of that company for um, what are the costs of the consumables involved with that. So when you, you. when you go through the, the CO2 extraction process, the further you can concentrate those cannabinoids before going to chromatography will have a, a huge uh, a huge factor into the cost of your uh, chromatography operational costs. Uh, so by further concentrating cannabinoids down to like a distillate form or somewhere in the 90, 95% concentrate range, uh, you're going to have less volume going through that chromatography equipment, thus having less of an impact on the amount of consumables that you need to get it done. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so our next question is, how can you winterize your oil extracted from CO2? Do you have to use ethanol? And again, remember to speak slowly. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, no, no problem. Yes, uh, primarily people are using ethanol for the winterization process. Um, now that said, you're not using it in volumes that are comparable to an ethanol extraction. Uh, thus, usually eliminating the, the need for higher facility requirements or class one division two rated facilities. Um, now, that said, people are looking into other de-waxing methods uh, via centrifuge or, or other medias that they're trying to pass it through. Um, but the, the most well-known or the, the most pr prominent way to winterize is going to be with ethanol. Now, th that said, I do kind of want to throw a caveat in here uh, to say that people will try and have the, you know, the argument that CO2 is cleaner than ethanol extractions. Um, at the end of the day, you know, ethanol is a food grade and a medical grade product. You can buy food grade or medical grade CO2. Uh, to say that one is cleaner in a pharmaceutical application than another is, is really false. Um, usually what people mean by a, a cleaner oil or a cleaner extract is the coloring. You know, with CO2, you're gonna have the nice golden color that people are looking for within their, their vape pens and their distillates. Uh, with an ethanol extraction, you're also gonna pull the chlorophylls. By pulling chlorophylls, you're gonna have a much darker product. You have to go through not only de-waxing steps, but also uh, discoloration steps to get back to that golden color that people want to see in their vape pen. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So our next question is someone wants to know if you know of a good resource that is a comparison chart for solubilities of all cannabinoids in relation to their solvents. So they said they're having a hard time finding information about this. Yes, yes, that is a difficult one to find. Um, there's a lot of paywalls out there to find these peer-reviewed articles uh, discussing the, the, the solubility of different cannabinoids at different pressures or temperatures or via different extraction methods. Uh, you know, I have some articles that I, I'm more than willing to try and share back to you to, to you know, pass out to everybody listening in today Absolutely. in terms of you know, the effects of pressure on, on CO2 extraction 
or uh, different extraction methods, their pros and cons. You know, I'm always happy to share as much information as I can so people are making an informed decision when they decide what kind of extractor is best for them. Great, thank you so much for that. Well, I will definitely um, get back to you for that information. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so three more questions and then I promise we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the next question is, what is the purpose of post-processing equipment? Does it fit all extraction methods or just those with solvents? Uh, so mostly with solvents, you know, the, the post-processing refinement, you're going to find they're, they're trying to isolate the certain cannabinoids that they want or the certain terpene profile that they want uh, without having the waxes, the lipids, the chlorophylls, things of that nature. While a lot of the equipment you'll find will be uh, ubiquitous across every different you know, extraction method, the ways that they're used would be different. Uh, so with ethanol extraction, you're going to have larger scale ethanol recovery equipment. Uh, and then turn it, in turn taking that, that to a, a smaller scale rotary evaporator that people are used to seeing with, with CO2 e extracts. Um, with the, the decarboxylation process, that's a, a very common, uh, it's a decarb oven that people are using. You'll find that in just about every extraction laboratory in, anywhere in the world. Uh, and when you get into chromatography, again, all the chromatography is going to be similar. Uh, it's just a matter of choosing which, which chromatography method is best for you, whether that's a flash chromatography, or a gas chromatography, uh, GC headspace is what it's referred to, or uh, HPLC chromatography. You know, all these different equipments have have different uh, different analytical um, factors that they can they can kind of provide for you. And you'll see that a lot of uh, you know, pharmaceutical grade labs they have more than one type of chromatography equipment in there. Great, thank you. Um, okay, two two last questions. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, what is the best way to extract terpenes? The best way to extract terpenes? Well, I am the guy that sells CO2 equipment, so take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I would say that CO2 by far is, is the best method for extracting terpenes. Um, you can also look into steam distillation. Uh, but steam distillation, once you've extracted those terpenes out, it's going to be you know, mixed in with a whole bunch of water. There's remediation steps that you have to take to get the water back out. Uh, CO2 going back to that selectivity within its extraction uh, affinity range. Now you can say, I want to focus on a very lightweight range of oils, low pressure, low temperature, very short time frame. Uh, by doing that, you have a very clean product coming out of the extractor that requires no post-processing to be before it's reintroduced into your final products. Perfect. Okay, last question. Have you ever sold extraction equipment outside of the U.S.? Absolutely, we have. Uh, we've sent our service teams to Colombia, to Switzerland, to Macedonia. Uh, we've got equipment in, in Canada, and we've got some equipment that may be heading to South Africa soon. Um, you know, being that we are the manufacturer for our equipment, we can build it to the specifications of where you are geographically. Um, do you need low ambient temperature controllers for your outdoor chiller? Uh, are you running on 50 hertz or 60 hertz? Uh, what is the available amperage at that hertz level? Uh, we work with people on an individual basis to make sure that the extractor that we produce for them is the right fit for them, not only for their extraction needs, but where they are geographically. Great, great answer. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. That is our last question. So now we can leave you be. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time today. And I, we had a lot of interest and a lot of questions. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.